Flightgate Broadcasting. is coming. Our storm. And when it arrives, it will shake the universe. Welcome to the Solar Storm. This is your host, Kyle Hunt, coming to you on RenegadeBroadcasting.com. Today's date is January 21st, 2018. Thank you for joining me here on the network. Check out RenegadeTribune.com as well, please. And also head over to the chat, RenegadeBroadcasting.Chitango.com. You can find it right there on the homepage. A big thank you to the hosts and contributors to this network. Uh, I encourage you to check them all out. We've had a lot of good people stepping up recently, and I appreciate all of the hard work. Tonight, I have a returning guest who really needs no introduction to those of you who've been listening to this show for a while. Tonight's guest is Mr. Frank Raymond, author of Sweet Dreams and Terror Cells. He's been on a number of times, and the shows were very much well-received by the audience. A number of people went out and bought the book, and they have been talking about it ever since. A lot of very interesting insights are offered in Frank's work, and tonight I have him on here to talk about the emotional warfare, the psychological warfare being waged against the white people of the world, in particular here in America and Canada. It's probably where we will focus the most. Right now, there's a government shutdown. Apparently, it's about the issue of dreamers and what to do with all of these illegal aliens. And who is leading the charge to ensure that all of them have a place here in the United States? Well, it's those pesky sneak rulers. Frank, Welcome to the show. I'm glad that you came back. One moment. Let's let's unmute Frank. Frank. Yes, sir. Welcome to the show. How well do you hear me? You're coming through loud and clear. Wonderful. And uh, I don't see a record button here, so I presume you're recording the show. Yes, yes. It's being recorded and also broadcast out live. Wonderful. Absolutely great. Um, actually, today I wanted to talk about the language being used, uh, not so much the psychological, the, there is psychological warfare through the movies and the advertisements, and of course in the schools, but I actually wanted to talk about the language used on the news and in the, uh, the way they frame America particularly. Um, as soon as someone objects to say, um, you talked about dreamers, right? Now, as soon as someone objects to naturalizing and uh, giving a piece of the land to the dreamers, they say, but this is not who we are. These are not, you know, the America is a nation of values. So I wanted to talk about that language because it really is very insidious. And um, uh, people don't seem to have a defense against it. I was wanting to also suggest some defenses. Um, well, actually, you could do that better than me. So, well, well, I think I'd say that all of this is lumped in there with psychological warfare. It's being waged on many fronts, and weaponized language, and memes, mm-hmm. are very important to our enemies when it, it comes to disarming, 
and just demoralizing white people and framing it so that anybody that resists their genocide is ostracized from good society. They're no longer, they're no longer politically correct. Hmm. But what surprises me when I watch American TV um, is that as soon as the people bring up this language, this very sneaky, you know, sneak rulers have sneaky language, right? <laughs> Uh, why else would there be snake rulers? Um, right. Snakes uh, with their forked tongue, right? That's well. The, the sneaks, S N E A K. Yes. S N E A K, sneak rulers, and the snakes, S N A K E, with their forked tongues. And uh, the forked tongue keeps flickering in and out. You know, it's really quite. That TV set is really the devil, right? Yeah. yeah. No. I, well. It, it really, it, it's been their, their means to control the minds of people. Before they could control all of the assets and all of, all of the different power positions, they really had to break down our defenses within our minds. And we don't have very good firewalls when it comes to absorbing media like mm-hmm. the television. And the brain does go into a kind of hypnotic uh, trance when watching television. So yeah. I stay as far away from it as possible because even at my level of awareness, manipulation can occur and uh, i don't i don't watch it but you do so you've been watching some of this filth uh, yes. I'm, glad that, I'm glad that you can offer an analysis for us yeah but i've developed my defenses they can sneak under my uh, under my defenses that easily i actually talked about the hypnotic effect of television on a show with georgia of ksco um I, it was called george frank and George and Frank Raymond on the Mind Masters. And uh, you, you actually posted it on the Renegade Tribune. Um, mm-hmm. But this language, I just find it astonishing that so-called conservatives and right-wing people don't really have an answer. They get stumped. They, get, uh, you know, they start gasping like fishes. Let's take the big example. Let's take a really big example. The other day... Um, uh, Donald Trump uh, raised, said that why are we getting so many people from shithole countries and uh, why don't we have more people from countries like Norway? Now, in the wake of that, there was a firestorm or a shitstorm, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and um, this uh, Lindsey Graham, Senator Lindsey Graham, gave the repost, which has become... Uh, is now turning into a meme. He said, doesn't the president know that America is an idea, not a race? And within the next few days, I saw this is being repeated all over the place. America is an idea, not a race. And then um, someone, I think again on MSNBC, was saying that just the other day, there was this fellow Tucker Carlson uh, well, he didn't mention the name Tucker Carlson. Is someone on Fox? Well, I know it was Tucker Carlson. Someone on Fox said that um, Arizona has become a total a Hispanic state. Most of the children in schools in Arizona are now Latino. It's as if the border has shifted up northwards. That's what Tucker Carlson said. And this fellow repeated that and said, "Doesn't this guy know what America is all about? Doesn't doesn't he get it? What this country is about?" America is an idea, he says. Now, what bothers me is that people don't seem to have a reply to that. Um, They kind of go, oh, yeah, sure, sure, man, we're defined by our values. And, of course, anyone can change those values. Now, what do you think of that? (laughs) Well, it's just so vague that people, I, I think, don't really know how to get in there and specifically defend against it. Well, what idea is it? Whose idea is it? And does this idea involve genociding the population that has become indigenous to the land? Well, my first thing is, if America is an idea, who sets the ideas? It would be the founding fathers. And very, they were very clear in the Constitution that they wrote it for their posterity. They may, it was the founding fathers who made the first Immigration Act in which they said immigration shall be restricted to free white persons free white persons. So the intent of the founders was very clear. If there is an idea, that was it. That this will be 
That was in place until about 1965. That idea was still prevalent. And even after the Immigration Act, people still considered America to be, the, well, well, a nation of white people. Yeah, so now uh, that's changed. Obviously, the landscape, uh, the transformation is so complete. Nowadays, no one dares to bring up the Founding Fathers or the First Immigration Act or, or even talk about the immigration up to 1965. No one dares to say it. It's always been a nation of ideas, a welcoming nation, a melting pot. Um, people don't seem to have an answer to these, but I would have given an answer. I would have said, America is an idea. So next, you'll be saying Japan is an idea. A country is defined. The, you know, they keep talking about America is defined by its values. And they say that in Canada, that it's bound together by its values. It's unified and defined by its values. But if you took the Japanese people out of Japan, would it still be Japan? If you took the Korean what about, people... Yeah, what about my, Israel? Exactly. Is it, what is about Israel? Idea, or, is it, or is it the Jewish state? Oh, well, Netanyahu is very clear. He says, I want you to recognize Israel as a Jewish state. And he says that over and over. As a Jewish state, not just as a state, but as a Jewish ethnic state. Now, the point is that the, they talk about values. Why doesn't someone say the primary value of a country is its ethnicity? Uh, you know, the example I gave you, well, if you, took the, um, if you took the Chinese out of China, it wouldn't be China. The primary value of China is the Chinese people, the Chinese race. And nobody seems to be able to say that. Um, I just find it very strange uh, that people are so tongue-tied immediately upon in the face of this attack. And I was wondering if you could suggest a few replies, um, good replies. Well, I, think a, a, I think a counterattack would, would be in order. Uh, and you, you can even concede a little ground, say, even if you think that America is an idea, does that justify committing genocide against a disenfranchised population known as white people who are discriminated against by law through things like affirmative action, diversity quotas, and other such measures to ensure that their population and wealth within the workplace, within uh, in institutions of higher learning, and just in general in the community are decreased. Trouble is, you wouldn't, a, yeah, you wouldn't get anywhere if you gave that reply and said genocide, they'd just laugh you out on mainstream TV and say, what genocide? As I see it, you know. They tried that. They tried that with me. There was Tom Hartman who inter interviewed me in 2014 on TV, and I proved conclusively, in my opinion, that indeed a genocide is taking place according to the UN's own definition of genocide. And if, if given enough time, you can explain this case and it becomes apparent that what is taking place against white people is genocide. As for dealing specifically with the topic of uh, America being an idea, you know, I really haven't watched TV, so I haven't really thought about this one so much. But your, your counterattacks are, are pretty good. Uh, I think that really just trying to figure out whose idea it is and where these ideas about America becoming an idea really came from, uh, pointing out some things like how the melting pot was conceived by Israel Zangwill, yes. a Jewish person, or how the Statue of Liber Liberty poem, which has also been you know, bandied about recently, was written by Emma Lazarus. Bandied and about? It's being quoted every five seconds, it seems. I, I wouldn't know. I really wouldn't know, but I just assumed that th this this poem has played a big role. And it, it, this has nothing to do with the founding values of this country. Just because Jews write poems and throw them up on some monuments doesn't mean that they're our values. Well, doesn't mean that they, they define the country. People really take a lot of, they take the symbolism very, very seriously. I well, think, and they, they embrace it as their own. I actually analyzed the whole Statue of Liberty and the Nation of Immigrants myth. And that's another thing they bring up. We are a nation of immigrants, so we are not a nation of uh, white people. Uh, with, you know, the 
American civilization was not built by white people, we're a nation of immigrants. Um, I actually analyzed the whole thing in another show with Georgia of KSCO, and I put it on my YouTube channel. Um, uh, my YouTube channel, by the way, is When Giants Break the Spell. And I guess you can figure out who the giants are. <laughs> anyway, uh, on the YouTube channel, When Giants Break the Spell, that video is still there. Uh, the lie and myth of a nation of immigrants. Now, the Statue of Liberty was actually a present from France. It was designed in France, built in France, and shipped over to the States. And uh, it's a French icon, not an American icon. It doesn't represent any America or any American ideals. It's from and, uh, as well. Yeah. And uh, it was celebrating the French and American cooperation in the American War of Independence. And the statue holds up a tablet saying 1776. It gives the date, actually, of the signing of the date of the Declaration of Independence. It celebrates the Declaration of Independence by the Founding Fathers, who were making an ethnic state, or a mix of all the Caucasian peoples, who, were, by today's definition, would be called racist. Um, Somebody has to point that out, that that Statue of Liberty has been hijacked. It, it celebrates the independence of America and the signing of the Declaration of Independence. It never was about immigration. But no, Lady Liberty, Lady Liberty, uh, calling to the huddled well, masses. I'm, going, I'm, I'm just going to put this out there because my position is I think that this conspiracy has gone back quite a ways, and I don't trust Masons one bit. They're Judeo Masons. And the whole idea of this liberty and, uh, you know, it goes right in hand with uh, egalite and fraternite, right? These are the motto, the motto of the French Revolution. So I'm very suspicious about the, the founding of this country, though you're correct. In the founding documents, it means that the people who founded this country and their posterity, which means the fu their future descendants, are the rightful owners of the land, uh, are the ones who should be running the country. Now, immigration did take place. In many ways, the United States is a nation of immigrants. Yes, these these liberals, lefties, uh, and anti-whites in general, they are they are correct there. However, however, the immigrants who came here and built the country were white, and actually many of them came enslaved. This is yeah, a very key true. point that the nation is missing was not from the narrative. But the nation was not founded by immigrants. It was founded by seafarers, pioneers, settlers. Um, they didn't apply for a visa. Explorers. They did right. not apply yes, that, for a that visa. Is a okay. But that's not what I wanted to talk about, really. Uh, though I'm just saying that these are the things that shut up people. We're a nation of immigrants, and people are immediately shut up. We need replies. Or some other stupid slogan. We all bleed red. Yeah. So does yeah. my dog. So you're right. We need we need replies that that quickly shut down that argument. Yeah, pithy, pithy, strong, uh, pithy, short, pungent replies that will get the other guy just as tongue tied. Okay. Now I wanted to start with an interview in which some of these ideas are very. Some of these attack weapons are used, and. Um, on the 21st March 2017, on the Tucker Carlson show, uh, this was held in the wake of a rape at a Maryland school. At a Maryland school, illegal Latino youth raped a girl. Uh, I'm not sure even who that girl is. It could have been another Latina. It could have been a Latina for all I know. But it started a bit of a hoo-ha, and um, the... There was a lot of um, pushback, and Tucker Carlson decided to interview this man called Zeke Cohen, Z-E-K-E, -E, and then Cohen, of course, C-O-H-E-N, from the name, obviously, a Jew, and he did say so, that I'm Jewish. And he was a member of the city council, a Democrat, and the day before, or in the days before this interview, he'd made a statement that these uh, immigration officials, the ICE officials, they're going around uh, trying to catch illegals and deport them. He compared them to Nazis. He said, I, they remind me of the Nazis and the Gestapo. So, very much that was his language. 
and it was reported in the papers, and Tucker brought it up. Now, I'll just go through the interview, and you and I can look at the where the word weapons and the insidious attacks come in. The, the, the word weapons, the mind twisting, okay? We need to think of them as missiles or bullets that are shot against us because that's exactly what they are. They're yeah. using these to attack us. But this uh, missiles and bullets are honest. They fly straight. Why don't we think of twisting snakes that sidle their way around them? Uh, and and walls of sorts, uh, yeah. Yes, let's think of them as snakes, twisty, sneaky snakes, word snakes, verbal snakes. So Very Tucker asks him, Tucker starts off with Mr. Zeke, uh, asks Mr. Zeke Cohen, yesterday you sponsored a resolution that passed on the Baltimore City Council that demanded that the federal immigration authorities stop enforcing immigration, federal immigration law in the city of Baltimore. Why, given what happened, is that a good idea? And this gentleman, Zeke Cohen, replies, I am incredibly proud to serve the citizens of Baltimore. Baltimore is a welcoming city. Now, there the first attack came. It's a welcoming city. In it's also America blatantly untrue because it's a very violent city <laughs> where you do not want to go because you yeah, might get killed. But that's the microcosm. In general, they say America is a welcoming country. That's who we are. Okay, so Baltimore is a welcoming city. And the reason I introduced this resolution was not to tell ICE not to operate, but to, target, but to only target violent criminals such as the young people who allegedly perpetrated this crime. There is no place in our country for this kind of sexual violence. I condemn it wholeheartedly. The vast majority of immigrants in our community are peaceful. They pay taxes and they contribute. Now, did you notice a loaded word there, Kyle? The word contribute? Yeah, I was going to say that one. Okay. What kind of contribution do they make? Well, they, they have great uh, spicy food, right, that they bring along with well, them. That's one of the big, the big things well, that they well, contribute. We're, we're well, let's the, talk about that word contribute because this is the word you're going to hear a million times. On whatever TV channel, they'll say that these immigrants are very good people. They contribute. They contribute to the economy. They contribute to our social fabric. They contribute to our culture. But, and then the other, other verbalization is that, um, well, as long as the guy is contributing, paying taxes, you know, as long as he's basically saying as long as he's not taking welfare, he's should be welcomed into the country and he's legitimate and he's a valuable person. So the word contributing, as long as he's contributing. Now that's actually a very insidious word because if you hear someone is contributing, he's contributing to you, right? Now let's analyze that a little bit. If I contribute to the cancer society, I take $5 out of my pocket and give, you, give it to the cancer society. I sacrifice something, I lose something, and they gain something, right? Yeah? Yes. But that's not what's happening. The immigrant, legal or Ill illegal, he works. He picks, potato he picks carrots, or he works in a factory, or he works as a waiter. But he works for himself. He's not contributing to you and to your pocket or to anybody. He's working for himself. How on earth does that constitute a contribution. Then the other argument they use is they pay taxes, as if that was enough to justify the invasion of the U.S. by the whole world. They pay taxes. Well, of course they pay taxes because they take police protection. They drink the water. They um, uh, get uh, to walk in the parks. Well, uh, how on earth does that justify anything? They pay taxes. Especially when they're paying taxes to uh, a government that is has proven itself to be anti-white for quite some time. What does that matter to me? Yeah, what does it matter to me, to you? And the fact is, how does it mean that they are valuable or in any way an asset? An asset, or how are they adding to your to the welfare of the uh, true Americans? The it, it also the shows the way that they, they, it shows how they view people. As simply just consumers or producers or things to be leached off of. 
their their mm-hmm. value is in their how much economically they can uh, produce. It's all about GDP, right? It doesn't yeah. matter about you and me. It matters about GDP. But here's the second thing that are they contributing? As I said, they're not. They're working for themselves. Oh, and but, they send all their money out of the country too. Not all of it, but lots. A it's lot really, of it. So lot much. Of it. I, I forget the statistics, but it's a massive amount of money that's being sent outside of the United States because of all of these uh, invaders that exactly. have come illegally into this country. So what are they really doing? Where there was um, five parking lots, now there's 12. Where there was a spacious city block, now it's a mess of apartment buildings. And they're drawing the nutrients out of the soil, depleting the soil. They're lessening the amount of water there is. The amount of water is finite. And when, ext- when millions of people use up the water, they dry it up, basically. So they're crowding up. They're basically drawing out resources that uh, Native Americans, and um, I'd use the word true Americans, uh, I could be using. And they're, in fact, robbing the country of resources. When there's, instead of 50 million, when there's 200 million, they rob the first 50 million. They crowd up the country, they deplete the soil, they create gridlock in the traffic. The petroleum, the scarce petroleum resources in the soil are being used up. Um, Your minerals are being used up. So there's no contribution here. It's outright you know, outright depri- deprivation of the true Americans and outright um, robbery of resources. There's no contribution here. And they're taking a lot of jobs that young white people could be doing. But mm-hmm. they're, they're discriminated against, as I said. There's a policy of making sure you pick everybody but the white people first. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, when you say depriving jobs, I always get a bit queasy about that. You know, a job has to be... Um, a worthwhile uh, right. job has to be productive, and it, basically, people work to produce the goods and goods and services that they need. So, what's basically happening is that these people are willing to work for very little. So, the native white population right. is out of a job. Did you have a yeah. friend on the hey, we have a we have a break coming in here. I we'll be back in just a little bit. Liberty. They tried to sink her to the bottom of the sea. She kept on floating into his story. Unmarked jets flew down from the sky and shot up our ship and nobody knew why. A torpedo boat blew a hole in her side. A lot of sailors hurt and 34 died. Come to find out it was part of a plan They'd sink our ship, she'd go down with all hands Blame it on Egypt to trick us in a war The trick didn't work, the crew showed them what's for Did you have a friend on the Liberty? I had a friend on the Liberty Who tried to sink her, it was Israelis But she kept on floating into his story Jews control money, government, media, and academia Repeat Jews are poor. The government and media are anti-Semitic. Hola, you've just heard chosen, one of the oldest languages known to ape. Try another. Mayanta is fat, ugly, and Sephardi. My wife is beautiful, intelligent, and spiritual. Good job. We have chosen learning pods in synagogues, lodges, even selected pizza restaurants. Learn chosen and stay ahead. Vaccines are safe. The Holocaust was real. (laughs) So fluent, so chosen. Fees, obligations, and genital mutilation apply.
Welcome back to the Solar Storm tonight. My guest is Mr. Frank Raymond, author of Sweet Dreams and Terror Spells. Frank, I know you have a lot of notes here tonight, so I don't want to bog you down too much, but these are interesting points to consider. Before the break, we were talking about jobs and yeah. your thoughts on immigrants taking jobs. So, yeah, please pick up where you left off. Well, um, wait a minute. I've got a... My screen's gone. I noticed on this call there's a fourth unknown caller. Yeah, the, the call in line is open, and oh, people see. are calling in via their phones. Okay. So, you know, in my book, I did try to expose some of these um, tricky words and um, these charged words. I tried to expose them, but there's a limit to how many you can expose in one book, right? And I certainly did not expose the word contribute. But it's a deadly word. They will use it over and over that these uh, immigrants, legal and Ill illegal, even they're contributing. And you really have to have a quick, pithy answer to that and say, no, they're not contributing. They're working for themselves, using up the resources and space and um, the soil that is ours. They're robbing us of, you know, they're impoverishing the country. They're not contributing. Let them contribute in their own country. Um, I think and you need a quick lots of crime. crime. They contribute a lot of crime. <laughs> and um, statistics show this. And that's, that's why they've lumped in uh, white Hispanic together. And oftentimes when a, a mestizo commits a crime, it's blamed on a white man statistically. But mm -hmm. when they're victims, ah, then they magically become Hispanic. Okay. Now, you brought up an interesting point, though. Very interesting, Kyle. If you don't watch TV, but 99% of Americans do, and on TV, what this, the conservatives, whether it's a, a senator, congressman, or Tucker Carlson, or Laura Ingram, you probably don't even know who Laura Ingram is, but she argues against immigration, and uh, so does uh, Ann Coulter, who's probably better known, Ann Coulter they don't seem to bring up the essential thing that they are using up resources, they're taking up space, they're causing overbuilding, slummification. In essence, they are, you, they are occupying the land of our people and they're crowding us out. Instead of that, they talk about crime and killings, crime and killings. They'll focus on Kate Steinle. They'll, even the latest ad that they took out only today, I believe, was um, that if um, for the next time an illegal immigrant murders an American, the Democrats will be to blame. So talking about crime and murder misses the point that this is our country. We are being made strangers in our country. We're being crowded out of it. Soon we'll have only one-tenth of the soil. We already have less than half. This soil is for us. I, I think we should... Uh, talk more about that and less about crime and killings but the the mainstream media the uh, sorry the mainstream politicians always attack on crime when that's not the central issue the central issue is the founding people are being dispossessed and they are not among the people of their own community with whom with whom they have a community of soul and a community of the heart they are surrounded by strangers whose very faces make them feel uh, uncomfortable in the sense that they don't have a community of spirit with them. Um, that's, I wish that's because, of, that's because of ingrained racism, they say. And we've just got to uh, get oh, get at the baby the babies early enough. You know, they, even the babies have ingrained racism, so that's why they need to be indoctrinated. And this upcoming generation, you know, some of the the younger ones, they'll be able to really embrace this much better than some of those old people who. Just need to die out, as Oprah said a few years ago. Oh, yeah. So, you know, they'll keep saying that it's just a little more indoctrination needed, but they really, you know, they don't use the word indoctrination. They say more education. Um, but anyway, uh, I hope that we can teach people to talk less about crime and killing and more about we are being dispossessed. Soon we will not have soil to draw food from because 20. Aliens will be drawing food from it. Uh, soon we'll uh, cease to exist. 
um, maybe you know more talk about our country and we are being dispossessed of our country we are losing you know we are being confined into shabby crowded housing because of this uh, over overpopulation and overcrowding anyway uh, let me continue with the interview and i was hoping that you might find some pithy answers to pithy short pungent uh, quick comebacks to these attacks I'll try my best. A little tired here tonight, but I'll, I'll do my best, Frank. <laughs> so they have a palaver. Tucker and Zeke Cohen have a palaver about illegal immigrants and crime. And once again, Tucker talks about crime. Why doesn't he talk about the dispossession of his people, the soil? But Tucker, let, uh, Zeke Cohen replies, but Tucker, let me say this. What concerns me in addition to this type of crime is also what I've seen ICE, ICE, do in Southeast Baltimore. Um, which I represent, where just recently a father was arrested as he was dropping off his son at school. He has no criminal history. His only history is violating his status and returning to this country, meaning the guy was kicked out and returned again. He escaped violence in Honduras just the same way that my great-grandmother escaped violence and persecution in Austria and we welcoming, welcome him here. Uh, Mr. Zeke Cohen is speaking for who I don't know. He said, we welcome this Honduran here. Immigrants built the fabric of this country, and Baltimore will continue to welcome them. Now, what do you think of that? Well, uh, this is definitely the Jewish talking point. They use it all of the time. They say that they the Torah teaches them to welcome the stranger. You can obviously show how this is not the case in Israel. They actually ship some of the Africans that come come in there up to Sweden, say, nope, nope, not welcome here. And they've recently been deporting uh, bl all of these blacks back to Africa, even though they're Jews. They're, they're spending a something about $9,000 per person to get them out of there, and they're forcefully removing mm -hmm. all of them. No, there's they're, the they're, cel yeah, they're celebrating this, and all of these very caring Jewish voices here in this country who just want to welcome all the immigrants don't seem to ever mention that or try to browbeat the Israelis and say, you're not doing enough to help well, them. Well, they don't welcome them into the community centers, the Jewish community centers. I doubt they welcome them into a Jewish hospital. I don't know about that, but I know they don't welcome anybody into a Jewish community center. And uh, they have a lot of money, and they're not actually just forking out their own money to say, hey, you know, come, I'll build you a house. I've got some land. I'll put you up. You know, it's the taxpayer needs to do more for you. Some, well, other, some of them, the, the Goyim, they need to... They need to take better care of you uh, while you know, well, he's just making quite... a great deal of money running the American Jewish Congress or something mm -hmm. like that. Well, what I'm thinking is pretty insolent that he welcomes uh, aliens into somebody else's house, the mm -hmm. house built by the children, by George Washington and Thomas Jefferson and their children. He welcomes people into someone else's house, and he's very assertive about it. Baltimore will continue to welcome them, meaning me, I will continue to do it. And that's what you get for letting this fellow in. His great-grandmother, he said, escaped violence and persecution in Austria. Now, basically he's saying that um, America has given refuge in the past to people who are escaping persecution or violence, and it has to continue to do so, and even, if, you know, even if it turns into a country of a thousand million people. Um, and uh, immigrants built the fabric of this country. Um, 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 excuse me? Um, there's the way you could have a quick reply. And no, it was pioneers and settlers who cleared the forests, chopped down the trees, dug the tree stumps out of the ground to make farmland, who cleared, who, who staked the fences for the ranches of Texas and of Oregon. Uh, no, immigrants did not build the fabric of this country. The foundation and fabric of this country was built by heroic pioneers and settlers. And the recent immigrants, the ones since, say, 1920, 
have built nothing. They have just uh, added to the housing, added to the factories needed to support them. There has been no building as such. There has just been, in fact, since 1920, the country has been destroyed, not built. It has, um, and that applies to Canada as well. Uh, beautiful neighborhoods have turned into crowded ones. Uh, parks have shrunk. Um, uh, even uh, individual houses have been uh, the same lot that uh, uh, that once housed one family has been chopped up into four lots. So um, the, there's this thing. Immigrants built the fabric of this country. He basically says that immigrants built this country. And that really is not true. And we need an answer for that. So anyway, Tucker Carlson replied to him, I think it is pretty unbelievable that you would compare ICE, I-C-E, Federal Immigration Authorities, to the Nazis, which in effect you just did. And you did explicitly yesterday, which he had, when they're enforcing laws that would have prevented this heinous crime. Would you say that to the parents of the girl who was raped, that these are Nazis, they're these Americans who are enforcing immigration laws? Would you say something like that? So there you see the Nazi card that um, this man actually said the federal immigration authorities were just like Nazis. Now, how do you reply to the Nazi card? Because it is so charged with uh, oh, negativity and ugliness. Yeah, there are so many different ways to do it. It depends on who I'm talking to, I'd say. But... The... <laughs> Uh, it's it's just amazing how Jews always always bring up the Holocaust to win to try to win any argument. It's I I I might just say that. Why do you need to always fall back on the Holocaust to justify all of these programs that are essentially genocidal in nature today? Well, well that, that, that's not that's not something that would go over well. Let's say with the whole TV viewing audience of America. So. Now, I'd have to think about this one, Frank. How, how do you think that white people should deal with uh, being okay. compared to Nazis okay. for, for wanting to for wanting right. to okay right after their right after this, I'm going to go to a short interview with a guy who wants to gag white people, and he's not a Jew. He's an Ismaili, actually. Uh, he brought up the Nazi card, so let's uh, try to deal with it there. Uh, let's. Um, come to Mr. Zeke Cohen's reply to that when Dr. Carlson asks him, how dare you compare federal immigration authorities to the Nazis? Well, he didn't reply to it, but uh, we've got a twisted snake-like reply. I extend my full sympathies to these parents. Oh, I bet. What they've been through is horrific, and to trot their crime out publicly is really kind of shameful, Tucker. And I think that the politics you're engaging in is this sort of Willie Horton style of race baiting dog whistle where we don't blame entire groups of people for the heinous acts of a few. For example, we're not. After Dylan Roof murdered nine people in a church in South Carolina, we don't say all white people are terrorists. That was the reply. <laughs> Yeah, actually, a lot of them do. <laughs> that's that's how they they paint us. It, what's incredible is they they often fall back on uh, past crimes of white people from centuries ago to make it seem like all whites today are guilty. But you can't even hold uh, a black youth or an illegal immigrant youth accountable uh, for their own deeds. Uh, actually, it's the fault of white racism. That's why they did it. Systemic uh, racism is why they did it. You can't even hold an individual criminal, uh, if they're not white, uh, up to any kind of standards of behavior. But we have to answer, as uh, white people need to answer for uh, crimes that were supposedly committed by somebody they might have been related to hundreds of years ago. Mm -hmm. So, Tucker did come back on that and said, you're, you're the one who's dog whistling. Uh, you are, you're the one who explicitly compared federal immigration officials to Nazis. Who's using the dog whistle here? Who's making demagogic statements? They're Nazis. You're calling fellow American citizens Nazis. So he had a good reply. Are you really an office holder? Why would you say something like that? And the reply from Mr. Zeke Cohen is, so what I'm doing, Tucker, is comparing the plight of my great-grandmother who came here from Austria 
to escape Hitler's gas chambers to the same fate of my Honduran neighbors who came here to escape violence from their country and just want to build a better life. So there's two things there, that anyone who comes here is about as, saint, as saintly as someone escaping the gas chambers. Uh, these Hondurans, I doubt that they're escaping any, you know, they're just economic migrants. Um, but they all came to be, claim to be escaping some sort of horrific persecution. And they just want to build a better life. And that's the other thing that's repeatedly said. Their only crime is that they came here seeking a better life. Oh, yeah. have I heard that a million matter. times. It doesn't even matter if the first part is in place, that they're fleeing some, somewhere where there's terrific violence. They're refugees. That doesn't even matter. Now, well, they're, they're just economic migrants. They want a better life. You'd do it too. You'd go yeah, and... Actually, I would. You know what? If... if if I was able to get a whole bunch of free stuff from Mexico, if I could get an easy life down there, and if they gave me preferential treatment, hey, maybe I'd go down to Mexico and say, hey, Mexico is just an idea after all. Well, here's the thing, that the refugee argument that they're escaping persecution and Americans, it's implied, have an obligation. They can't stop it. They can't say no. You are obligated if someone's escaping persecution or claims to be, and of course 99% of these people are making false claims, but that doesn't matter. Suppose it's real persecution. Suppose it's a civil war. Like in Burma today, the Rohingya people are being uh, attacked and targeted by the Burmese government. And the, implic and the Americans are told that you have to take them in. This is the kind of people we are. You have to take them in. You're obligated. The trouble is, Kyle, that there's also America and Canada also signatories to the UN Convention of Refugees in which they cannot turn back someone from the border. Now, I know that. I know that anyone can turn up at, the, at an airport in Canada or America or, in fact, anywhere in Europe and say, I'm claiming refugee status, and there's nothing you can do about it. You have to let them onto the land. You have to give them legal aid. You have to give them welfare. You have to give them a hearing. There's a very expensive, resource-consuming progress process just to hear all this. Now, you, if that, that is suicidal if you accept that because there will always be trouble in the world and there will always be people alleging, even if they're not persecuted, they allege, allege they're persecuted. You will have to say, this is not a whorehouse. This is the country of my people. But nobody seems to be able to say that and you need some kind of a one sentence reply to that well to say, I, I might actually bring it down uh, real quickly I'd, I'd bring it down to the the street level the the microcosm and say well if somebody just showed up at your door at two in the morning ring your bell they look completely disheveled and bloody and said yo i, I i'm being uh, somebody i was getting shot at you gotta let me in you gotta give me some place to sleep and you gotta feed me would you would you say Oh, and yeah. not, not, only, not only give me temporary shelter, let me into your house forever. Forever, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, somebody's chasing me down. You've got to let me come in and live there forever and uh, take care of me. And that then, could... oh, uh, by the way, I've got, I've got a whole family and some cousins and some you know, grandparents. Everybody's, they got to come in too, and you've got to take care of us. And you're going to have to eventually just get out and just leave us your stuff. That's actually, actually, that's what... Black people, black activists in the U.S. have been saying is that old white people, if they want to not be racist anymore, they just got to leave their, their family's possessions to disenfranchise blacks. It's insane. Well, they've been saying that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, uh, the, the young up-and-coming uh, Black Lives Matter people, some of them just come out with these insane talking points and demands. And who knows who's really behind it, but they just get more ridiculous by the day and nobody really calls them out, puts it into check. Well, your reply was actually a very good one. If a guy came and said that I'm being chased and so I'm going to take, you've got four bedrooms, uh, four rooms in your house, I'm going to take one of them forever. And I'm going to be in your house forever, no matter how uncomfortable you are. That's actually a really good reply. But another reply would be that um, I'm not going to dispossess my children because you're being persecuted in some other country. You find some other solution. I didn't cause the persecution. I'm not responsible for it. 
um, I think there's a common saying that I will not set myself on fire to keep somebody else warm. <laughs> That's a good one, yes. So we need a reply to that one. Um, the refugee issue is a really serious one because the Europeans are being absolutely inundated with it. And they're told that you have to, you know, that, um, inter that anyone who's been displaced from his country is entitled to protection. We can't say no. They're entitled to it. They have rights. They have of the course. rights. The obvious question is, why don't their ethnic kinsmen over there in, let's say, Saudi Arabia open up their borders and say, come in, fellow Arabs, we'll take, fellow Muslims, we'll take care of you. You'll feel much more at home here. No, instead, actually, Saudi Arabia, at the height of this crisis, offered to build a number of mosques within Germany. I think they offered to, to finance the building of 300 mosques in Germany. Yeah. That was their way of helping out. Well, none of these people are eager to help. It's very rare that a country outside the white world helps, any, white world helps anymore. One of the rare examples was during the Hezbollah war of 2006, when the Israelis bombed Lebanon to smithereens and said, we'll destroy whatever progress, economic progress you've made. They even bombed grain silos and, and granaries. And uh, millions of people fled into Syria, and the Syrian people actually opened their houses to them. Uh, the Lebanese went back eventually, but the Syrians actually did open their houses to them. That was one of the very rare cases. In this present crisis with Syria, the other countries are not really willing to help. You know, uh, certainly the UAE and Saudi Arabia have just said no. Um, you know, it has to be said that nobody has a right to my country. You can't tell me some fellow is being persecuted, so he has a right to my country. Nobody has a right to my country. I will not dispossess my children. Um, some sort think, of replies. Do you think, Frank, being an outsider uh, racially looking in, that there is something... Well, that, that is maybe a fundamental, some people call it a fundamental flaw, you know, pathological altruism. Is there something you think inherently within white people that's a little too kind and caring and naive and trusting? Uh, because I've seen so many examples of white, white people being incredibly fierce warriors, but then when it comes to some kind of underdog that they're, you know, or, or that they're supposed to help out, then they become these, you know, bleeding hearts, just like the IRA in Ireland. Oh, you know, waging fierce war against the English. And now they're all about you know, anybody who, who wants to, to keep these Africans out of the, the British Isles. Well, they're the problem. Well, or, you and I, are, Ireland, they're the problem. Yeah. You and I have actually discussed this, um, this very issue of the Irish, and my reply was that the ultimate defense weapon is not a rifle or a gun, it's your brain. Uh, if your brain is scrambled or if the, an enemy can occupy the undermined, uh, you're done. Uh, you're already defeated. It doesn't matter. Uh, but the, do, you, do, you think, do you think with proper indoctrination that the Indian people would act this way or some, some Arab people could be taught to uh, welcome the stranger, hate yourself, and, uh, you know, basically... No, I don't, I don't think so. Um, the, um, it is only white people who are vulnerable to it. It's a combination of two things happening here. White people, as, as you implied, uh, as was contained in your last sentence, white people are more compassionate. They are more universal outlook. They think that if, every, if the universe is better, then I will be better. Um, they are more compassionate. As you see, they're compassionate to animals in a way that's unique. Uh, they are more compassionate, but then there's the combination, the other factor, that the sneak rulers have got into their minds and uh, leverage that compassion to make them suicidal, you know, in effect. Um, Altruism doesn't have to be a good thing, but when you have, I mean, it doesn't have to be a bad thing, but when you have uh, a pathogen in there, then it becomes pathological. Yeah. The point is that there's a pathogen there. Exactly. It's a, the pathogen, pathogens make for pathologies. Um, if tomorrow you remove this Negro regime and their occupation of the media um, and you 
started a re-education program, all these people would swing around. The same liberal fanatic would be talking quite differently within a month. Uh, in fact, I predict to you that if the sneak rulers lost control of the media and the education system for one month, white people would start waking up. They have to be I pounding it to you continuously, constantly. If they lose you for even a short time, you'll recover your sanity. Yeah, I think a lot of these people who are social justice warriors might see the injustices that are, and I'm not talking about the extreme ones that we've discussed with the dis, disgusting degenerate proles, but some of these people who really just have a kind heart, they'd start to start, well, feel compassion for their fellow white people. That well, perhaps they they'd will. start to see the, the persecution of white people and the denigration of everything that once was great about us. Yes, they would. Um, uh, believe me, they have to keep this absolutely nonstop, 24 hours constant without a break. Um, you know, you've heard of things like the Matrix. They have to give you the blue pill every morning to keep you, in, keep you stupefied. Uh, the truth has, a, has its own strengths. And um, I, I expect that there is a crash coming, a serious crash. And when that crash comes... There'll be such economic disruption um, that uh, so this media control, this mind master, this uh, mind control will also fail. Uh, we'll see about that. Anyway, I'll just finish with Mr. Zeke Cohen, who was, couldn't answer Tucker about his Nazi comment that, um, uh, again, for the fifth... Yeah, Frank, we're coming up on a break in, in just a moment here. So perhaps we should save that one uh, for the other side. Uh, but it is just amazing how after 70 plus years, it's still it's still just the Nazis. It's always the Nazis. It, it never gets old for them. They, they need this narrative completely. Uh, well, Kyle, if you had invested billions of hours into forging a weapon, wouldn't you use it? Yes. <laughs> that's, 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 that is their main weapon it seems these days okay stay tuned everyone second hour coming up YouTube showed me again. After getting censored relentlessly on YouTube, with video after video and channel after channel getting taken down, we have decided to try a different approach. We now have RenegadeVids.com, which features all the documentaries, parodies, compilations, sketches, and video discussions that are simply too accurate for the kosher censors. There are now many hours worth of hard-hitting videos waiting for you to watch and share. So get on over to RenegadeVids.com. Your own. 
Renegade Broadcasting. Hard hitting talk radio. of the freedom they had tasted and for the liberty they found ground beneath the heels of red jack boots one half of Europe ruled by the red beast was the other half for food thinking they were free was the alien power ruled at every feast? Welcome back to the Solar Storm. My guest tonight is Frank Raymond, author of Sweet Dreams and Terror Cells. When giants break the spell tonight, we are talking about some of the ways that they put us put spells, uh, cast these spells uh, with their broadcasting, so that white people can't think clearly can't defend their own interests. Frank, you were finishing up the chosen Cohen quote. Before the break. Uh, uh, yes, indeed, I was. Um, he, uh, well, Tucker said, um, for the fifth time, you're accusing your fellow American citizens who are law enforcement officials of behaving like Nazis. Don't you think that's um, a dog whistle? And he's a Tucker again. What I'm saying is, when the Statue of Liberty proclaims, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to me f- to be free, that she's calling both to my great-grandmother <laughs> and to my Honduran neighbors. I'm not comparing ICE to, ICE to Nazis. What I'm doing is to say that these people who've been persecuted back in their home country, and if they want to come here and build a better life in Baltimore, we welcome them. Now, you notice there's quite a few little... Uh, bullets there, or poison pills in there. There's the Statue of Liberty. There's my great-grandmother who was being persecuted by the Nazis, and the Hondurans are just the same. And of course, you know, you can't argue with that one. Oh my God, that's ultimate persecution. And they've been persecuted in their home country, and they want to build a better life in Baltimore, which is not their country. Now, uh, We've been through those little things, but what, I'm, what comes to mind is that they have the same talking points. They're not, never anything new. Is the same five talking points or word weapons over and over. They just regurgitate them and reorganize them, but it's the same. But here's the interesting part of the interview. Here's the really interesting part. Cohen admits that Baltimore is struggling with high rates of crime, murder, and poor education. But then he says the part that will really interest you. In fact, Tucker, what we faced for a very long time is depopulation. And the immigrant community, particularly the Central American community, has actually come here and rebuilt. Um, And Tucker says, is it good for the present denizens if there are floods of people who do not speak English? And of course, I think the greatest asset in our city is our diversity. And I was joined by an amazing group of immigrant youths yesterday in passing this resolution. I asked you a sincere question. Does it improve a school to have kids come here who don't speak English? And Cohen replies, absolutely. So if you're talking about a city that used to be a million people and is now down to 630,000, having folks come here and participate and pay taxes and sending their kids to our schools, that is a blessing and we welcome those children. Now, notice something. The population was, according to him, a million people in Baltimore. It's now down to 630,000. Don't you think what's really happened there, the white people who built the city and lived there for a long time have been ethnically cleansed out of there, driven out by the alien faces, the alien language, the schools full of alien children? 
they frame um, it as white flight. Like white people are just too afraid of diversity because they're they're born racist and also you know they're they're just this is systemic racism. They're they're blamed for being ethnically cleansed. Yeah. So now here it is, Baltimore. The white people have fled, and here is Mr. Cohen saying that we can't have um, you know the the city not being a million people. So we got to replace them. Now that word. You know, the term replacement really describes it perfectly, that white people are being replaced in their country. And here's a guy saying, well, I'll replace them in Baltimore. First, I'll make it difficult for them to live here. Well, he didn't say that, but that's in effect what happened with all the crime and the dirt and the, the overcrowding by aliens. Uh, literally, he's saying that they have been chased out. Now we're going to replace them. Um, of course, a normal person would say, why is it necessary to have a million people? Six, 630,000 is, is too much. But no, we're going to replace the white folks who fled. Um, that's interesting. Anyway, Tucker <laughs> terminated the interview by saying that your city is depopulating because you had 6, 630 murders last year and you don't take it seriously. No. That's pretty alarming to me that they've got this new approach that we'll just bring in lots of Somalis and um, Ethiopians and Indonesians, make it so overcrowded. Yeah, Nicaraguans, and we'll make it so crowded and so unpleasant, white people will flee, and then we'll say, well, you have no choice but to replace them. You know, we can't have schools lying empty. Let's just uh, bring in some another million from abroad. Pretty disturbing, don't you think? That's actually what they did over in Britain and a number of other places when all of the white people died in World War II. They said, well, <laughs> somebody's got to do the jobs. And, uh, oh, these, these immigrants are going to help us. But they actually did. Uh, Britain repurposed Germany's strength through joy cruise ships as vessels to bring over uh, people from outside of England, you know, outside of the uh, part of the empire. Well, let's bring them into England. That's when it, it really kicked off. And it's, yeah, they, they use this over and over again. Well, white people have been ethnically cleansed or genocided in some needless conflict. Well, we've got to replace them and we'll do it with dark skinned people and we'll encourage them in every which way to interbreed uh, frank i just wanted to to point bring this up before i forget I, I i'm almost certain this is true and it's from canada council of concerned canadians this is a flyer that somebody found interracial unions are morally sensible and biologically advantageous and then they go through some supposed statistics about the uh, interracial unions in Canada and how they they produce this hybrid vigor. They don't call it that, but that's you know, the argument. The hybrid vigor. They're they're attractive and they're they're better fit for this and that. And this is just is love. The last little part here. Beige is the color of love, and yeah. this is white genocide pro- propaganda. It's amazing. It's a, and this is this is seen throughout every single movie throughout every single uh, kind of official state sanctioned outlet and yet we're told that white supremacy runs the country in america it's a white supremacist country and the same thing you know is is i i don't think they could say that about trudeau up in canada but still the argument's made you know we need to dismantle this systemic white supremacy well, what system has white supremacy up there in canada none well, the Canadian cabinet seems to be uh, almost, you know, totally non-white. The immigration minister is a Somali. The defense minister was a Sikh from India. And, of course, you know, the supremacy never stops, does it? Mm. Yeah. Well, we were talking about the, um, the Nazi card. Now... Tucker Carlson tonight was talking with an Ismaili man. Um, now, the man's name was Kasim Rashid, and he's a spokesman for the Ahmadiyya National Committee. The Ahmadiyyas are a sect of Islam, the particular sect, the one denomination of Islam. 
And uh, the the issue at at hand, the cause celeb, was that Trump had retweeted some tweets by one Jada Franson of Britain First. And Jada Franson had, uh, I suppose, put up some videos showing uh, non-whites beating up Dutch Dutch people. Uh, and it was genuine. The, this Dutch boy was on a crutch. He was on crutches, and this uh, brown, uh, Middle Eastern-looking guy beat him up pretty badly. But uh, when Trump retweeted that, he was under much attack, and this interview took place. And um, Mr. Rashid was saying that people can criticize Muslims freely. People are criticizing Muslims freely, and there's never that, that's not the issue here. The issue here, we have a situation around the world where, for example, in, a, in the United States, hate crimes are at a 20-year high against Muslims. And um, so forth. Um, uh, he says, here we have a woman, Jada Franson, who claims there are Muslim migrants coming up and beating up a poor Dutch boy, inciting racial tensions, violence. Now, to him, that's a problem. Here's a woman who claims there are Muslim migrants coming up here, coming up and beating up a poor Dutch boy. And by pointing that out, she's inciting racial tensions and violence. The guy beating up, when they're beating up the Dutch or raping German women, that doesn't incite violence is when you point it down. But here, Tucker actually interrogated him pretty toughly and said, I want to pin you down. I don't want you to be slippery with me. So you're saying she's guilty of a hate crime? Answer of well, Mr. Kasim Rashid. What I'm saying is when you put, promote deliberate false information against already marginalized minority, just like promoting myths about Jews. Uh, notice that? <laughs> now, this guy is a brown guy probably from the Indian subcontinent. He is a Muslim of the Ahmadiyya sect. But notice how he's turning to Big Brother. What I'm saying is when you promote deliberate false information against already marginalized minority, just like promoting myths about Jews. So Tucker says, so you're, not, so you're actually not for free speech. Basically, this man is saying there should be hate laws and Jada Franson should be prosecuted under the hate law for having... Oh. Yeah, and in Britain, they they certainly do. They do not have free speech. I I am one hundred percent convinced that Jada not not only does she have ethnic uh, Jewish heritage in her bloodline, I mean she is openly very much in in line with and promoting you know the the Zionist state of Israel, promoting. Uh, all the controlled opposition, you know, the Tommy Robinses and everything. Well, she's a but, dubious but, person. She's a dubious oh, yeah. person. Let's put it so, that. Yeah, so I, I do think she's put out there to to be this kind of, you know, bad guy in your face. Uh, well, to face. show you the ugly face of British nationalism, the ugly right. face of nationalism, the ugly face of these racists. That's why she's right. there with that red hair and that. But... The point is that this Ahmadiyya doesn't know that. He's saying that um, uh, she, sh she should be prosecuted under the hate crime laws. And, uh, and his look at the... oh, so, Real quickly, just, just the pe people are rotting away in, in jail uh, for, for just saying uh, bad things, you know, for, for in, the, in the state size, bad things about other people, for posting uh, on Facebook for actually committing no real crime where anybody was hurt, while the uh, people who are raping children, who are so-called Asians, that's what they call you know people from Pakistan, they call them Asians. Yeah, the Asians uh, can get away with raping children. That's perfectly fine. But if you're a racist, oh. No, it's much better to be a, a brown rapist than a white racist. Well, this, is is a, this is a really typical historic phenomenon of oppression. Uh, when someone is, has the power and is oppressing you, that's what happens. They can commit the crime, but if you point it out, then you get prosecuted. And uh, that's happening over, you know, we're seeing that over and over, that uh, just to point out the crime is, is the crime. You are causing division, you are causing, um, you're tearing apart the social fabric. Uh, that, you know, what you pointed out is the old 
characteristic of oppression. Marginalized group, uh, you know, that was that was something that was said uh, by Kareem there. Marginalized group. Look at London. Look at the capital city of the English people. It has Sadiq Khan in there as as the the mayor of London, and you've got. Uh, oh, he's really got, marginalized, isn't he? <laughs> oh, oh yeah, and, and you've got, you've got the the makeup of the the city being minority British. And I think there are a lot of British cities that have Muslim mayors. A lot, not just London. I think look at the United about. States. Yeah. Every, major, every major city has been ethnically cleansed of many, many white people, and they've lost most of their positions of power. Yep. Um, definitely, definitely no pro-white in any position of power. Oh, absolutely not. No pro-white has any power. It's, you know, you're on the fringes right now, marginalized on the fringes. But look how he turns to Big Brother. So what I'm saying is when you promote deliberate false information against already marginalized, just like promoting myths about Jews, and Tucker cuts him short and says, so you're actually not for free speech. His reply? Uh, Mr. Kasim, no. What I'm saying is when someone promotes Nazi ideology in a country where Nazis have mass murdered millions of people, I can't defend that. Maybe you can defend that. So here was a video of, an, of a Middle Eastern looking person beating up a Dutch boy. And, he say, and Mr. Kasim goes to, ah, that's promoting Nazi ideology in a country where Nazis have mass murdered millions of people. I can't defend that, okay? And Tucker says, why are you accusing me of having Nazi views? I didn't accuse you, I just, do you think this woman should face charges? Simple. Reply for promoting violence, yes. If it's just criticizing Islam, no. But she's not promoting violence. She's just showing a video you don't like. Now, to be clear, Kyle, the video showed a Middle Eastern man beating up a Dutch boy, a man on crutches. But to him, to Mr. Kasim, she's pro showing that video promotes violence and she has to go to jail. But she's not promoting violence. She's just showing a video you don't like. Kasim, she's promoting Nazi ideology. So you're not for free speech. I almost fell for that. She's spoken Nazi. She's Nazi. Oh, that's not allowed. What you call Nazi should be banned. Tucker was actually pretty fast there. Oh, that's not allowed. What you call Nazi should be banned. Reply of Mr. Kasim, I like my Jewish friends. I don't want them to be killed by Nazis. Believe me, this is, <laughs> taking, this is taking place on Fox News, the most popular channel, the most watched show in the whole of America. This bunkum, this buffoonery is taking place on mainstream television. Uh, she's not, that's not allowed. What you call Nazi should be banned, uh, says Tucker. And he replies, Mr. Kasim replies, I like my Jewish friends. I don't want them to be killed by Nazis. And Tucker replies, I hate the Nazis, but people have the right to say. And he's cut off by Kasim, who says, you're defending Nazis. Tucker, <laughs> I'm not defending Nazis. I'm defending free speech. And there's a squabble. At the end of it, Mr. Kasim Rashid says, I'm opposed to Nazis. And Tucker, <laughs> ends the, Tucker ends the interview. All right, all right. Okay, I got it. Big Nazi, big Nazi. <laughs> so what do you notice there is that in asking for repressive laws to shut up whites, even when they're being beaten up, you have to cover that up. You, can't, you don't dare expose that. This man, who is not a Jew, who is a Muslim, and a brown man from Asia, has turned to the big brother. He's turned to the big brother of Nazis and the Holocaust. They know where the word weapons and the mind weapons are. Yeah. You notice that? I'm actually surprised Tucker didn't say, well, aren't you just trying to ban, uh, burn books just like the Nazis and repress you know, freedom of expression? I'm surprised Tucker didn't go that route. I don't, I don't approve of that route. I'm just saying... Uh, even people who are, you know, su supposedly against the system will still use the Nazi card. <laughs> uh, these these people have learned very well. Um, I remember there was this black man, a very chubby black man, who led a 
um, what he called an anti-racist organization in the UK. And he was opposing Nick Griffin, Nick Griffin of the British National Party. And he appeared in an interview. And uh, they said, you know, what are you yapping about? You know, Nick Griffin is just saying, let's limit immigration. And this fellow immediately said, well, I, uh, do you really want to listen to this um, uh, hate-mongering, Holocaust-denying party called the BNP? <laughs> that black man, who has no conceivable right to settle in Britain, he has his own country back in Africa, but he wants to colonize Britain. And he immediately says, Holocaust denying. <laughs> oh, yeah. They know, uh, there are many good goys out there who know where their bread is buttered. Oh, yeah. And they, uh, and they know how to shut down debate. That, that's the way it's effectively been done for quite some time. Oh, essentially, the ideas you're advocating lead to Nazism. So we can't even tolerate them. This is the kind of tolerance we have. We talk all about tolerance, but we are completely intolerant of your ideas, and we are going to make them illegal because they are Nazi-like. Well, that weapon will be brought up over and over, and we need a reply to that. Tucker's reply was that, you know, well, I'm not a Nazi. and Why do you bring that up? But the fact is it has powerful associations. They've linked, they've conflated and glued together this unbreakable association between patriotism and Nazism. Uh, white people wanting to retain one inch of their country, that's Nazi, that's putting Jews in gas chambers. Some answer has to be devised for that, some effective, quick answer. I'm, I don't know what that is, but I'm putting this out for your audience, basically. Yeah. Now, let's take another little a little trick, and um, this is one you'd probably be more comfortable with. Uh, you've heard of Laura Ingram? Yes, I have heard of Laura Ingram. Yeah, she has got a show now, a show of her own, the Laura Ingram Angle. And um, she had a show on 30th November 2017, after that horrific day when a court exonerated the illegal immigrant who murdered Kate Steinle. What a ruling that was. Here's a man who actually murdered with a gun this girl, Kate Steinle, and he was exonerated by the court. Amazing. But uh, that should have caused more of a firestorm. Anyway, Ingram had a show, and guess who came up against her on the show was Michael Wiles, W-I-L-D-E-S. W-I-L-D-E-S, Wiles, Michael Wiles, immigration attorney in New York City, and also a Jew. I'm so surprised. Yeah. Laura Ingram said, his lawyer had the gall today to say that this case has nothing to do with illegal immigration. Um, and um, she went on to say, the defense lawyer said essentially that this ver ver verdict vindicates the right, rights of the undocumented, which the lawyer had said, basically. So Wiles replied, Michael Wiles replied, this sadly, though a terrible event, is an isolated event. Uh, this is the fault of poor prosecution and inefficient immigration officials. And then he came to the point, today we cannot scapegoat immigrants or immigration or refer to, to these people by one big C. I didn't quite catch what he meant by that. That is, as people who would cause Americans harm. Let's not forget... Unless you're an American Indian, we all hail from immigrants. Ingram cuts him short. Michael, please spare me the nation of immigrants cliche. Now, here's the point that in the very first opening of this man, he said his attack was, let's not forget, unless you're an American immigrant, Indian, we all hail from immigrants. So this shuts up most white people that uh, when they protest the continued immigration and influx of alien peoples, they are told, uh, well, you're, you're an immigrant too. You know, you're descended from immig immigrants too. This guy's an immigrant. You're on equal par. This is as much his country as yours. Now, what kind of reply would you have for that? 
<laughs> well, for that guy, I'd say, is Israel, the Jewish state, a nation of immigrants? And, of course, he'd reply to that, no, no, we, I, this is given to us by God, and we have thousands of years with the history. You know, so no, he'd say America is different. That. that was given by God. The realtor in the sky gave that to us, but America is a land for everybody. That's basically what he'd say. Yeah. Uh, these are it's apples and oranges. It's always about the Indians. That's one of the, not always, of course it's Nazis, but they love to play that card. The, the Indians, uh, the very peace-loving, beautiful people that welcomed us with open arms and gave us maize. We need to remember them because oh, mm. evil whitey. But how, do you, how does your average white answer that? How does your average white answer that when they say you're objecting to this immigrant? Well, you're an immigrant yourself. Uh, well, for myself, that, that was very, very long, a long time ago. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's something that I, I, I really think that there is no good, quick answer for that I've come up with. But if you are given a little bit of time, you can really explain these things. Well, you need I, I, to. My, my ancestors, I have some that were murdered by these loving American Indians. And, of course, Native American is weaponized language. But it, it, it's, not, it's not easy for a lot of people to get over the, the Native American card. I, it, it's oh. becoming ever more relevant you know, every Columbus Day. They'll, they'll keep talking about this issue and reminding us that we were once these refugees who came here. We need to, do, we need to make sure that uh, we welcome those who come. We weren't welcomed by the, these loving Indians. Mm, <laughs> Not at all. Try- they, fought, they fought to keep the land their own, as they rightly should have. I would, I would concede that. They were right to have fought against. The, yes, uh, but they didn't white. believe in diversity or being enriched by immigration, and they didn't believe in the um, universal nation. They just scalped people, didn't they? All right, last half hour coming up. extra shekels well join juba juba with their jewish partners the italian coast guard and other ngos are recruiting now we require sea taxi transporters to pick up negroes out of the mediterranean the more bodies the greater the pay no sat nav required it is a one-way fare and that is northwards to europe so join juba today let's increase white genocide and make those shekels on the side. Juba, the transportation company.
Frank, before the break, we were talking about the Native American card. And it's not an easy one to really go through uh, because well, okay. there are so many different different ways that this could be attacked. You could talk about the Salutrians, but most people, no. they're not going to go watch the videos, not going to look at all the evidence. But it's a fact that actually there were white people here long, long ago, and they could be considered well, Native you, Americans. You won't get away with that. You, it won't be effective when you speak to Mr. Average. Right. But exactly. there is. That's, that's what I, but there are effective arguments. Now, in chapter two of Sweet Dreams and Terror Cells, I had a person, um, I had um, Gary completely expose his sister, his liberal sister, as insane on this very issue. He said that, okay, so you're for the Native Indians, and you say they're the legitimate owners of the land, and we are illegitimate, right? And his sister says, yes, his sister Elizabeth. And he says to her, but you're also for immigration and multiculturalism, right? And she says, yes. He said, well, why then, if you respect the rights of the Indians to the land, why do you want to bring Chinese settlers and Korean settlers and Somali settlers to dispossess the Indians of what's left of their land? Secondly, if you say that it's not your land, that we are illegitimate, if it's not your land, how is it you arrogate to yourself the right to give it away to uh, Indonesians and, and the Zambians? How do you give away what is not yours? So there are answers. Uh, but they're not pithy, they're not short, they're not, yeah. they're not like one-sentence put-downs. Um, right. I had a... I, one of my eyes, I was red-pilled actually once. When I came to Canada in 1987, and I was watching this program called Forum, where they were discussing this very issue, and uh, some white liberal woman was saying, but this is one world, and if we don't act like this is one world and let everybody in, it will be no world. Um, some East Indian stood up, an East Indian meaning from the Indian subcontinent. Well, if you want to know whose country this is, ask the native Indians. And they all cheered uproariously. But I was saying, that why doesn't one of these white people just shut him up and say, if this is the land of the native Indians, what are you doing here? Right. How dare you be here? You know, well, there were, answers there, there are. Actually, there was an article that was written by, I think it was a, an Amerindian from a southwestern tribe. I forget which one. And he, he was talking about how disgraceful it is that white people are giving up possession of the land that they took from the American Indians, but did so by defeating them. And now the, the American Indians are having this land just given away to people who never defeated them in battle, who never honorably, you know, uh, waged war against them. And yeah, some of the warfare wasn't all that honorable. It was, it wasn't on either side. And actually I'd say it was a whole lot more savage uh, from one way to the other. That would be, uh, white people on the receiving end of many of these conflicts, but we're meant to, we're we're told to to hail the the, you know, people like Geronimo and oh, Custer was such a was such an evil man. When it's uh, it was actually a, Custer's soldiers were vastly outnumbered. We used to, we never hear about that. And in, in any event, there are uh, so many different. Well, the native Indian attack, I don't think, is a serious attack. It can be countered. But the one he brought up, Michael Wiles brought up, that we are all immigrants, that kind of puts you on a par with yesterday's Somali, who came in yesterday. And I think the answer to that is, no, I'm not the children of immigrants. I'm the children, I'm the child of the founding fathers, of the Mayflower people, who conquered, settled, and built this civilization, this prosperity. I'm not the children of immigrants. I'm the children of heroic pioneers and settlers. I'm the child of the builders of this civilization. I think that should be the answer. It's not like we came over and said, hey, uh, 
can you build us some teepees so that we can live in there? And, you know, could you, could you give us some food stamps? That wasn't what, what happened yeah. with white people. And I also think bringing up the uh, indentured servants and literal white chattel slavery uh, could be a good thing. But then again, most people out there don't even know about it. So they think it's a conspiracy theory, even though it's got so many different facts behind it. And they might never go and research yeah. it. I'm and throwing it out there to your audience. Maybe they'll give suggestions on how to have a quick answer to these uh, very um, effective um, uh, accusations that cow you. You're literally cowed and shrink before them. But I'd like to go on to a white traitor, uh, one of the suckers of the regime who is selling out his own people. This is a congressman named Robert, uh, quotation marks, Beto, B-E-T-O, O'Rourke, R-O-U-R-K-E, Democrat from El Paso, Texas. And he was on Tucker Carlson tonight on 11 January 2018 for the simple reason that he had uh, been pr- proposing legislation to enable the colonization of his people and their dispossession. And Tucker Carlson was questioning, um, why are you sponsoring all this legislation? And some of it is pretty extreme. So his reply, I think that most Americans, most Texans, certainly those I've listened to across the state, want to make sure that the dreamers can continue to remain and thrive in their communities. You have people like Sarbonafris, I may have pronounced that wrong, some Dhaka guy, who I just met, a PhD student in mathematical biology in Texas Tech. She's a dreamer. You have people like Alonzo Guillen, who tried, who died trying to rescue his fellow Texans during the flooding after Hurricane Harvey. He was a dreamer from Lufkin, Texas. I was in Booker. Booker is as Republican as it gets in Texas, and the people were concerned about dreamers because they had deported one of their honor roll students at Booker High School. And Tucker basically said, okay, so they're all geniuses and so forth. Now, this is continually being thrown out that they're so talented. Well, if they're so talented, I think the answer is, why don't we send them back to Mexico or whatever country they came from? Because those countries need them more. I mean, yeah. you know, they're so talented that we Americans can't do without them. We, we don't want to lose these jewels and you know, rolls of platinum. You know, we don't want to lose these diamonds and sapphires, these precious jewels that have come here. But if they're so precious, don't uh, Uruguay and Mexico need them more than us? Those benighted countries? Um, um, I th- think there's a quick answer to that one. That oh, the West yeah. was humane thing to do is just send these um, Einsteins and and um, what is it, uh, Thomas Hobbes, you know, yeah, the social there, scientists. There is some real truth to that, though, because uh, and this this deals not only with illegal immigration but also legal immigration, which would be H one Bs and and other kinds of uh, forms of people uh, living and working in in the the United States. Uh, it is actually a brain drain from a lot of these countries. And it's even within this country, we're talking about the white flight, the ethnic cleansing of whites from cities. And let's think about Baltimore, probably a lot of decent, hardworking uh, black people left. If they could afford it, left that area too, when it became super violent because of their their fellow black people, Mm -hmm. they left there and you're, you're kind of left with some of the worst of the worst of the people that, are so impoverished that they, they have no other option. And now we come to the to the um, more hardcore stuff. And Tucker says that um, the question is there are a lot of good American citizens too. And uh, Mr. O'Rourke replies, from my perspective in El Paso, Texas, the city that I represent, where I'm raising my three kids who are 11, 9, and 7, um, I want to make sure that our community continues to thrive. And one of the reasons we are the safest city in America every year for the last 20 years is we are a city of immigrants, including dreamers, 
who contribute to our success and our safety. Oops, what did he just say? And they contribute. Yes, we are the safest city is because we are a city of immigrants. Now, I have to immediately assume that redneck, cowboy hat wearing uh, white Americans are criminals. I mean, you know, we are, you're not safe. You're, you know, you're much safer if you have colored immigrants. Isn't that what he said? Oh, yeah. Violent white racists. That's the main problem here. Mm -hmm. Ordinary Americans are kind of criminal and violent. And that's why we got to have immigrants. And um, then we'll become safe. We are the safest city in America because we are a city of immigrants. Obviously, white Americans are just a bunch of thieving, knifing trash, right? Yeah. But then comes the other pill, the other poison pill. And that benefit, he said, these dreamers who contribute to our success and our safety, and that benefit is spread out over everybody in my community and throughout the state of Texas and this country. So it is very good for America, not just for dreamers, not just for their families. So I think most people would see this as a net benefit. So he's saying that people come over here in hordes, even if they come over illegally in hordes, it's a net benefit. Because then that benefit is spread out. Well, how is it that if people, totally alien people come and crowd up your country and use up your resources and force you to build stack and pack housing and turn your cities into slums, where is the benefit there? If you have a city of say 20,000 people and it grows into a city of 100,000, where's the benefit? There's a benefit more burrito for shops. The more oh, burrito that shops. That's what, that's what they say. It, it justifies it. Like, I can't roll my own damn burrito. I'm a good cook. <laughs> the, the, uh, that, that argument, that is thrown out there more, more than... Uh, it's, it's just incredible that they, they can get away with that one. That, oh, don't you like eating all of the diverse food? Shouldn't that be reason enough that you willingly cheer on the genocide of the white race. Mm -hmm. Anyway, they bring benefits. I mean, you're more economically benefited by these people, presumably, because they're so talented and hardworking, whereas you are just lazy bums, right? Anyway, Tucker doing replied. The, doing the jobs that white people don't want to do. Because we're just yeah. so stuck up. and <laughs> You're just lazy and you just... You're so inept and mm -hmm. worthless. You couldn't Entitled. exist without, without the almighty foreigner. You couldn't exist, could you? Mm -hmm. Tucker replies, I just checked out the school numbers that you're bragging about. And El Paso is a great city, but 39% and only 39% of your graduating seniors are ready for college in math or English. It seems that's a bigger crisis than whether or not people who are here illegally can bring their relatives from abroad, don't you think? So anyway, Tucker refutes him. So this fellow replies, and here this is, it would be interesting to listen to the reply. I don't think working on these things is mutually exclusive. You won't find anyone who has worked harder or done more for veterans in this country for example, when it comes to mental health care, than me, he's basically saying I do things for white people too, for non-immigrant, for non-immigrants too. At the same time, I can advocate for the success of my community and our country at large by ensuring that those dreamers stay here. I can advocate for the success of my country by ensuring that those dreamers stay here. Did you just hear that, Kyle? Mm -hmm. The success yeah. of the country depends on hordes of illegals pouring in, and if they leave, we're not going to be successful. You know, we're going the to lose idea, us. The, the label of dreamer is such weaponized language. It, it harkens back to MLK, I have a dream, and also, of course, the American dream. Yeah. That's why they're here. They're chasing the American dream, and we damn well better Give it to them because we're Americans. We embrace the idea of America, and well, they contribute to America. Well, as some people say on Fox News, our children have dreams too. Yeah. American children 
our children have dreams too. They are dreamers as well. Yeah. We don't also, want their dreams to be buggered. Yeah, real quickly, uh, some dreams aren't so good. <laughs> are we creating a nightmare? That's a good question to ask. Yes, indeed. Uh, so what is the final part of that statement from Mr. O'Rourke from El Paso? So it is very good for America, not just for dreamers, not just for their families. Oh, wait a minute. I missed something there. Um, oh, okay. No, no, no. I, I, actually, I, let me go down. Okay. I can advocate for the success of my community and our country at large by ensuring that these dreamers stay here. By anyone's measure... There is extra extraordinary positive economic benefit to those dreamers staying here, the jobs that are created, the dollars that are spent in this community. Aha! Did you hear that? There is extraordinary positive economic benefit because if the dreamers stay here, the jobs that are created, the dollars that are spent. Well, gee, if 20 million people flood into Texas, Jobs will be created because they'll be working for themselves. Not for you, Kyle. They'll be working for themselves. Building uh, houses for themselves. Yes, burritos, for themselves. burrito stands for themselves. Digging up the soil and depleting, depleting the fertility of the soil for themselves. And fertility is an important issue. If you don't think so, look at the tired farmlands of Asia where the Carrots that come out are now sour, and there are no minerals in them. There's no nutritional benefit in the potatoes and the carrots. But uh, these uh, positive economic benefit to the jobs that are created, that in fact the jobs they do for themselves, not for you and your family, Kyle, the dollars that are spent in this community, well, what do I care if 20 million dreamers work for themselves and spend dollars buying burritos and, and, you know, buying windows for their houses. But this is the way it's put by this congressman. Extraordinary positive economic benefit to overpopulating and slummifying your country because jobs are created. Well, why stop there? Why not have, instead of 800,000 dreamers, why not bring in 50 million or 100 million people from Africa or from uh, Indonesia. Why not? If if just bringing people over creates prosperity, bring the whole bloody world in. You know why stop at eight hundred thousand? What what example throughout time can be can you provide to to prove your point that just bringing in everyone and anyone from around the world is going to just be a a, a great boon to your economy, to to your country, to your your well being in general. You know, why not just ask people, how did China climb from the poverty of communism to the prosperity of today without immigration? Because according to these folks, immigration is the golden route to economic success. You can't have success without immigration. Uh, one, you, know, you just imagine how the Chinese did it. How did they climb, pull themselves up? You know, how did they do it? I'd like to know. I mean, not a single immigrant to enrich them or to create extraordinary economic benefits and to create jobs, you know, and to spend dollars. I don't know. Amazing so, culture. They need, they, if they had more Africans, they'd be doing much better. Even though they're doing all right now, you know, if they're doing better than they were. They just, if they had more Africans, they'd be better off. So, Taka says, I'm sorry, but you can't prove that. And this fellow says, Eco economists have looked at this. And it is measured not in the millions, but in the tens of billions of dollars to the positive that dreamers bring to our economy. It's good for all of us. Well, of course, there'll be more dollars spent in your economy if you double your population. If you double your population, there'll be more people buying bread, right? But according to him, that's... That itself is good. It's not the million. It's not the dollars per person. It's the total dollars. So, as I said again, why stop at a million or two million? Why not just bring in the whole bloody world? Then there'd be so many um, billions of dollars that they'll that'll be brought into your economy. 
But this is well, the of course, for people like this, you know, for people that that run the show, it does you know, benefit them quite a great deal because they're not living in this the daily you know city life every single day. They're far removed from it and and raking in all of the massive profits from uh, either if they're white traders selling people out or from destroying a, a people that you you don't like so much. Yeah, you know, so they see a great profit in it. But this is the language that they get away with on television, speaking to the masses. They actually says that if you bring in all these people, millions of people, even illegally, it's a benefit because of, quote, the tens of billions of dollars to the positive the dreamers bring to our economy. Uh, for dreamer substitute, immigrant, alien, whatever. So... They actually say this and people sitting at home uh, swallow it. They say, oh, yes, billions of dollars are added to our economy. Well, they are. Yeah, but they're just not going into your pocket. You're just getting a little poorer. So then Tucker brings up the next question that you uh, sponsored legislation that would allow for the public to pay for legal representation for illegals. So the way he puts it is, why should people pay for legal representation for illegals? You sneak in, taxpayers pay for your lawyer. You sponsored legislation that would allow that. How does that benefit Americans exactly? And one would ask, you know, why would the American taxpayer pay for legal representation for an illegal to basically fight the system and stay here forever? And the reply from Mr. O'Rourke is, I think it's keeping true to who we are. When you have asylum seekers from the most violent, brutal countries in the world, I want to make sure that they have every opportunity to apply for asylum. And of course, for that, they need lawyers and we got to pay for them. So there's the loaded sentence. I think it's keeping true to who we are. And there, Kyle, is the big thing. They vaguely say, it's, uh, this is who we are. Well, who are we? It's time to ask that question. We just anybody can walk in and then is there a we left at all? But this is how they get you that we are someone special, idealistic. And so we must be true to that. We must be idealistic and let everyone in and actually pay for their legal fees. Legal fees to fight. It's it's just insane that the United States government would actually give uh, over many years, money to La Raza, along with all these other top corporations. When La Raza's stated, uh, well, stated goal is to reconquer Atzland, which is huge parts of the United States, for La Raza, which is means the race. So it's a racist organization, a racist anti-white organization that seeks to actually take American territory. And this group is funded by the United States government. Why would the United States government fund a, a group that wants to take territory away from it? Isn't well, that very strange. Your government is now in the hands of your enemies. It has been turned against you. The government is now part of the enemy structure. So nothing surprises me, even to listen to this man who has an Irish name, O'Rourke, and looks to me like an Anglo. And here he is making mealy-mouthed arguments for flooding the country with aliens at a time when the country is already overpopulated and impoverishing at rapid rate. Because he, he knows that I'd rather stick with the government that is part of the enemy because that's, they have the power. So I'll, you know, I know which, I want my bread buttered. He knows which side his bread is buttered on. Mm -hmm. It really is quite amazing. So there's the loaded sentence. It's, it's true to who we are. We are an idealistic people. We are not the white people who built the country. Uh, they don't matter. We just want to be idealistic and get everybody in, anyone who wants to come in. So then he says, Tucker asks him, why is it then the health care, not only lawyers, we not only pay for their lawyers, you want us to pay for the health care of those who sneaked in illegally. 
uh, now I'll give the exact quote. Why is it good for us to pay the health care bills of those who snuck in here against our law? Why did you sponsor legislation that would have allowed that too? Reply of Mr. O'Rourke, it's good for people who are in our country, who are contributing to our country's success, to be safe, to be healthy, to be able to continue to contribute. Now, did you notice that word contribute came in twice? Yes. Now, contribute ma makes you think that they're going to give you something, right? They're going to add to your wealth. You know, Kyle is going to have an extra $20 in his pocket every day because of these people. Now, that's why I mentioned that word contribute needs to be dealt with. The lie that these people are contributing. And they're contributing to your country's success. Just imagine. I don't know what country's success is defined by. But uh, are these people contributing to your ability to fly a mission to Mars? Or to create the next new energy technology? Are they contributing to that? Or are they just taking more resources that uh, bel should belong to you? Are they consuming the gasoline that comes out of the ground? The plastics that they consume with every package? Are they impoverishing you? Or are they just contributing? So that word contribute really has to be, um, that lie has to be exposed. That No, they're not contributing. They're working for themselves, for their own benefit, for their own selfish benefit. In the process, they deprive us of our prosperity and our country itself. They deprive us of our country. Yeah, you know, Frank, I wish white people would just realize no other people in this, in this world would be as kind as we've been. Uh, we hold ourselves up to some kind of ridiculous standard that's been imposed upon us. And... Uh, Nobody would have even been so kind with the Amerindians. Uh, other people would have just genocide them completely. There would be none of them left to complain from their reservations and casinos. But you're and, not kind. But you're not kind. They tell you that you're supremacist, racist, right. oppressive, that you have done more harm. Uh, Frank, we have run out of time. Thanks so much for coming on. Sweet dreams and terror cells. Everybody should pick that up. Okay, all right then. Thanks everybody for listening. Be back again soon. You're a slave to the capitalist system, which is real bad. The global. Working class white The fed this head with So much propaganda Renegade Broadcasting has a sister site where you can find insightful articles from the past and present the latest in health and wellness research, analysis of current events profound poetry, amazing artwork lots of videos and podcasts from other content creators and so much more we are in a struggle to awaken as many people as possible, put an end to our enslavement in this toxic culture, and create a future where we can be happy, healthy, and free. Go to renegadetribune.com, browse the great content, and do consider joining the crew in publishing your own original work. <laughs>